The nice thing if you've been playing a character for a while is that you can start to add more and more accessories. So for Aelia, the scientist, I want to add a nice field notes book. However, the dummy that I have for that is rather boring, so I want to make a nice leather cover for this field notebook. The nice thing about that is that her name will be on it, and I can put secrets in here and just leave the book somewhere. Other players will get to know her secrets and that might make for fun play. But that's enough about the project itself. I already made the patterns. It's basically just this square piece of leather that makes the cover. And I also drafted what I want on the front. It's pretty simple. It has her name. It has the sign of the goddess. I want some basket weaving here. And considering she's a biologist, I really wanted to add some flowers. Which for me is also a nice excuse to try the Sheridan style tooling that you see often in leather work. So without further ado, let's get crafting. Considering we already have the pattern, we can immediately start cutting the leather. For this, I used a veg tent leather with a thickness of about 2mm. If you would want to make something like this yourself, I think up to 3mm would work. You don't want it to be too bulky between the cover and the pages. This pattern consists of three pieces, the cover itself and the two strips on the inside to hold the cover to the book. For the cover, I didn't trace the pattern and cut immediately around the paper. For the inner pieces, I did mark around the pattern when the scratching all, so I knew the width. After which, both could be cut out as well. Hi, sort of editing Mariska here. I realized I forgot a step. After cutting out all the leather, you want to bevel the edges. So grab your beveling tool. and bevel those edges. You do this so the burnishing later on becomes even more nicely rounded. You want to do this for all four edges of the big piece and you want to do it for the inside edges of the two smaller pieces. That's all for now. Then it is time to mark the tooling pattern on the leather. For this, we wet the leather, position the tooling pattern and trace over the pattern with a pen. Because wet leather is soft, this leaves a slightly indented line we can use later. After that, we prepare our carving knife, wet the leather again and start carving. All of the lines we traced earlier are carved with the knife. To make sure the leathers on top align nicely, I carved some of them along a ruler. Leather is easier to carve and work with when it is between damp and wet, so I re-wetted it when I started to notice more resistance. After carving comes beveling. For this we use a beveling stamp, which is a slanted square. We line the so-called hue of the tool on the carved lines and whack the top with a hammer. And then slide it along the carved lines, trying to do this smoothly. This creates a nicely slanted edge, which emphasizes the carving and gives it some depth. For the flowers, you have to imagine it as a 3D object. You bevel away from the part that is in the foreground. So, any of the petals that are overlapping get beveled on the side that would be on the bottom. Again, emphasizing the depth of the carving. All of this tooling is too much to do in a day. However, you do not want leather to dry out completely. So, to store it in between sessions, I wrapped it in cling film and put it in the fridge. This way, you can store it at least overnight without it drying too much. This is where the fun, and for me unknown part starts. Trying to tool the flowers in a Sheridan style. This style creates the most intricate flowers by using a variety of stamps. So I found a nice old blog post and tried to follow this. After the usual beveling, I added the nerves to the leaf with a camouflage stamp. This was also used to make the center of the flower. On the leaves on the other side, we used the veiner tool all along the ridge of the main leaf. This was a completely new tool for me, but I loved the look it gave. Then I used a pear stamp to give dimension to the flower leaves. A pear stamp is a round, in this case smooth stamp, that as the name says, has the shape of a pear. With this, we made the flower petals look more wavy. Lastly, I used the backgrounder tool to give the inside of the letters some extra texture. And that was it for the main tooling parts. 
All that is left now is the basket weave portion in the right corner. For this, I carve two parallel lines to serve as the border. I purposefully have these intersect with the flowers, as I like the depth it gives. I beveled both sides of the border, again for more depth, and because it is easier to do before the basket weave than after. Then I looked at the types of basket weave stamp I have, and I really like the round version. It is pretty easy to use, it has quite obvious points where the tool has to be lined up, and if you work in straight lines, you don't even have to rotate the tool between the stamps. It was quite a while ago that I used this stamp, so it did take some getting used to again. It really needs a good whack to show all of the lines. If you don't get those lines to show up properly, the illusion of the leather weaving over and under itself will be lost. Eventually I got them all on, and I decided to use the camouflage stamp along the border to hide the fact that a basket weave stamp stopped here. This is not a mistake of sorts, having another stamp on borders is normal. You will never be able to line up this basket weave stamp up to the border completely. And this is the result. Pretty nice, if I may say so myself. Then it is dyeing time. Leather stains are very good at staining skin and clothes, so wear some splash protection. I love the red brown stain that I bought a while ago, so let's use it for this project as well. I like to apply this stain with an old cloth. I put some stain onto the cloth and rub it into the leather in circles. One thing I love about this stain is that once the initial color is on, it doesn't vary that much in color anymore. So it is pretty easy to get an even, no streak coating. The basket weave was pretty stubborn, so for that bit I used a sponge, as it will soak up more dye and can be pressed into the grooves a bit more than the cloth. For the edges I used the cloth again. Just rub it vigorously, as it isn't as smooth as the front, it will be slightly less easy to dye evenly. Just the dye isn't interesting enough for me, so I painted the leaves with regular acrylics. I was quite happy with the green I managed to mix up, so I used the same color for the goddess logo and the name. I used the plain and compared to the background, subtle red color for the flower, just to make it stand out slightly. And with that the painting was finished. Quite happy with how this turned out as well. Also, good that I decided not to do the letters at top. It really doesn't need it. The next step is to draw the grooves where the stitch lines will end up. And I always realized I wanted to do this too late, because I already painted this. If I make a groove, you will see the color of the leather instead of the color of the paint. However, as there will be stitches over it, I don't think it matters too much. So let's just draw the grooves. There's also another thing, and that is that at first I will only draw the grooves on this side, this side, and on this side. I'm not going to draw the groove on the top yet, because I made it too high. We can cut some off at either the top or the bottom, and considering I first planned to have the letters field notes here, and decided not to do that, I'm going to try and move this downwards a bit. But for that, we first need to stitch everything together, and then we can see how much we can cut off at the top. So. Let's start grooving. Yeah, this hair is really a case of too bad. Maybe later I can patch this up with a paintbrush, but we shall see. After the grooves we can hammer in the stitch holes. For this I used my trusty six pronged awl and hammered away. I overlapped the last two stitches each time to make sure it goes straight. As I will do the stitches all the way around, I made holes along the entire front. However, the stitch line is not 100% aligned in length with my stitching prongs, so I left the last two holes, eyeballed what looked good, and hammered the last two holes individually, dividing the last bit of space equally. This way, it won't be too visible that those stitches aren't all perfectly equal in length. Then I decided to paint all of the grooves after all. They did turn out slightly darker than the rest of the leather, but at least it shows up less than the plain colored grooves and we will have stitching over it anyway. I just got something new in the mail which I have never used before. This is antique gel. The idea is that you can rub this on, get it off again, and then you will have a nice dark lines in the carved parts. For this, I've got a test piece on which I want to try it first. And if that works, we can put it on there. The instructions tell me to use it pretty much the same way I use my stain. Put it on a piece of cloth, 
Rub it in there and then wipe it off again. It seems to have a bit of trouble getting to stick properly, but not too much in the basket weaving. But all in all, I quite like how it enhances, especially the flower parts of the carving. I chose the color tan on purpose, so it wouldn't alter the other colors too much, and I am happy in that regard. But just to be sure, I also applied a small coat to the inner pieces, even though they do not have carvings on them. Here I am once again, because I forgot another thing. Before stitching everything together, you want to burnish the inner edge of the flap, because later on you won't be able to reach this as easily. How to burnish? Just check later on at the video at this timestamp. Then we can start the next step, in which it will all literally come together. Because we matched up the stitching holes, we can just start at the top of one of the sides, and to stitch it all together, I will use a saddle stitch. For this we have a length of thread and two needles on both ends. The first stitch is easy, just widen the hole a bit with an awl and thread the first needle through, making sure both halves of the thread end up the same length. Then the actual stitching can start. Widen the next hole so the needle can pass through relatively easily. Pass this first needle through the hole, then pass the second needle through halfway. Then check the thread of the first needle if it can still move. You do not want to have accidentally poked the second needle through the thread. Then pass the second needle through entirely. After that this can be repeated. Just make sure you keep repeating all the steps in the same order from the same sides to keep your stitching even. I visually like to have the stitching all the way around the notebook cover on the outside. So once the inner flap is attached, I just continue stitching through a single layer. However, at this point the second flap is still loose and we won't know when we should start stitching that on. So I just put the second flap on and marked where it would start and which stitch would be the first one that needs to be stitched through both layers again. After that, we can finish stitching all of the punched holes. To properly end the stitching, we go back two stitch holes. Make sure both threads end up on the inside of the book and then snip off both of the threads. With this, we are nearly there. We can now insert the book as if it was the final thing. I pushed it downward firmly so it was snug in the sleeve. I then measured the distance from the book to the edge on the bottom, which was 6mm. I marked this 6mm line on the top and cut that part off. Then I grew off the stitch line again. Due to the height differences, this didn't turn out too neatly, but it will be covered with dye and stitches anyway. If you do this yourself, you might want to put a spare piece of leather under the part that only has one layer. This way, you compensate for the height difference. Then we can re-dye the cut edges and grooves. Punch the holes and then stitch the last edge. When I inserted the book, it wouldn't really close properly due to the rigidness of the leather. So I slightly wetted the leather around the spine, inserted the book and let it dry overnight with a weight on top. The next day, we end up with a nicely folded cover. But we aren't done yet. Next up is a task I quite like. I dabbed some tokernale on the edges and rubbed it vigorously with a burnisher. The friction flattens all the fibers which seals the edges and gives it a nice sheen. At the end, I give it a quick wipe to remove the excess. Then the very last thing to do is to give it a coat of either resilin or another type of finish. Here I have something called satin sheen, which ends up slightly less shiny than resilin. It goes on quite easily. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that it doesn't coat too thickly in the grooves and crevices. So I had to pay a bit of extra attention to the basket weave and stamping. I also never managed to get a perfectly even coat in one go, so after it dried I added another coat. Both coats also go on the inside to prevent the dye from staining the pages. And with that, the book cover is done. I am absolutely thrilled with the way the carvings turned out. I'm also quite pleased with the colors of the paint. The carvings stand out, but not too obvious. All in all, this notebook cover definitely fits the character. Next up, time to fill it with some notes.